Um, hi, uh, my name is Rafael. Thanks for thanks for inviting me for the workshop. It has been a great experience. We're learning a lot, and I hope that I can show a little bit of this work to everyone. So, uh, okay. So today I'll be talking about factors of low individual degree polynomials, and so the talk is divided into three parts. The first part I'm going to talk about the introduction and some background, which was covered in the bootcamp. And then in the second part, I'll talk about the main ideas of this work. And I'll finish up with some conclusions and, and open problems. OK, so let's talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit too fancy. I, I copied it from a friend. I apologize <laughs> for being so fancy. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Mother of the virus, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> factoring in real life. So, factoring is a basic routine in many tasks, right? And uh, for example, the one that we all know from complexity is, it's, for example, used in fast decoding of read solomon codes. But you know, if you talk to Kitten or to Ankit, uh, you can see that it's also used to compute primary decompositions of ideals, group their bases, and lots of other things in in the computer algebra. Right? So what's the good news about factoring here? Well, the good news is that it can be done efficiently in randomized polynomial time. So we're very happy about that. Right? But as we're complexity theorists, we, un we want to understand a little bit more about factoring. Right? And in theory, we're interested in de-randomizing the, the factoring problem. Or we are also interested in the parallel complexity of factoring which is still wide open. And moreover, in a more general setting, we're also just interested in the structure of the factors. So for example, if I have a sparse polynomial, are its factors sparse? Which can be disputed in this audience, which is great, but that's an open question still. Right? So now let's talk about arithmetic circuits, which we're all probably tired of hearing it. So let me define it by a picture. An arithmetic circuit is a directed acyclic graph. Here is going from bottom to top, where in the bottom you have input gates. In the input gates you have variables or field elements. I don't have any field element there, but you can if you want to. And each gate, each gate computes a polynomial in the natural way. So for example, here you have x plus y, here you have y minus x, and in the end you compute y squared minus x squared. So this model captures our notion of algebraic computation, which I guess by now you guys are more than familiar with. And there's two main measures that we have in complexity for a circuit, right? The measures are the size, which is the number of edges in the computation, and the other one is the depth, which is the length of the longest path from the root to the leaf. Right, so size pretty much measures the amount of computation that you have, and the depth measures the parallel complexity of things. And we're interested in both measures. So as we saw, many interesting polynomials have succinct representation in this model, even in constant depth. Right, such as the determinant and the symmetric functions. And it's a major open question whether the permanent has a succinct representation in this model. But we won't talk about it here. We're just interested in the factory. OK, so polynomial factorization. What's the problem? The definition of the problem is the following. Given a circuit computing Px, where, oh, and when I say bold x, it just means x1 up to xn, all the variables. So given a circuit computing Px, where p factors into a product of g1 up to gk, this may not be, uh, this may be the same as well, but I just wrote them in a simple way. We want to output circuits for that compute the polynomials g1 up to gk. Okay? And in complexity theory, you have a very successful history with factoring, because from the works of Leinster, Leinster, and Lovash, and Kalkoffen, we know that if p of x is computed by a small circuit, then all of these factors gi, they are also computed by small circuits. But don't you need a restriction on degrees? Yes, yes. We're talking about, yeah, so the degree of p is, of course, polynomial. We're assuming that, that p, yeah, so Ketan asks if we need a restriction on degree, we do. Otherwise, k could be exponential, and then outputting things would be exponential. Yes. <coughs> For things in vp, we have a very successful story, right, because then they prove that the factors have also small circuits. Right, for exponential degree, yeah, that's, that's false. So moreover, Kalkoffen also gives a randomized algorithm to compute the factors. Right, and that's what's mostly used. 
And this has fundamental consequences to circuit complexity to the randomness by the works of Kabanitz and Ipagliazzo and Dirch, Pico, and Udayoff. And also, well, also I can add GCT there, Bombole as well, as we saw in the NNL. And encoding theory in the works of Sudan and Guru Swami Sudan, and past decoding of Reed Solomon codes, and least decoding, and also geometric complexity theory, right? As we saw, the de-randomization of NNL requires the use of Kaltofen. Kaltofen gave a, a randomized algorithm that outputs the circuits. Yeah, that outputs the circuits, yeah. Give, given a circuit, he outputs also the circuit computing the factor. And it's probabilistic, right? With high probability, the circuits are correct. Yeah, so any field of large enough characteristic, a Kaltofen can do it. So, yeah, so if F has, let's say, I, uh, to be safe, if F has characteristic higher than the degree of the polynomial, then you're fine. Just to be on the safe side. Yeah, but but also small characteristic, but then there's some covers, yeah. small covers. Yeah, it works, oh yeah, exactly. You, you need we need some derivatives to hold, and then if the, de if the degree is nice within the characteristic, you can use Kaltofen, mm -hmm. but if the degree is not nice, if the degree is multiple of the characteristic, you're gonna run into some problems there. Then he cannot guarantee this is a, yeah, but he has another result for small fields. Now, the question is, what about that, right? Because what Kaltofen told us is, well, guys, Kaltofen said, factorization behaves nicely with respect to size, but what about that? Because in Kaltofen's proof, the depth of the circuit is actually linear, right? So we don't know anything about the depth there, apart from the standard depth reductions, which I'll show in the next slide, right? So more generally, Kaltofen doesn't say anything about the structure of the factors. So this is the main, I guess, like program that we have for this factoring, right? This, if I give you a polynomial P in a circuit class C, which class is C star? And here I'm not requiring C to be the same. Which class C star efficiently compute the factors of P of X? So for example, think of, uh, about P as being a sparse polynomial, or a, a polynomial computed by that three circuit, even bounded top penning, right? Think of a simple class. Now, can we say anything about C star that the classes that efficiently compute the factors of P? That's the main question, right? And some questions is, if P, for example, has a small depth circuit, do its factors also have small depth circuits? Or, well, if P has a small formula, do its factors have small formulas? So by small, by small here, I have to say that I mean polynomial, right? Because if I allow quasi-polynomial blow up, quasi-polynomial formulas is the same as circuits, and Kaltofen gives us that, right? So here, if, if you want to improve Kaltofen on the second bullet, you want to say polynomials that have polynomial-sized formulas, its factors also have polynomial-sized formulas. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. Yes, two questions. One, everything should be below NC2. When you say small depth, you mean below NC2. Because otherwise it's, it's constant. constant. Yeah, well, the first one here. Yeah, so the first one I mean constant. Yeah, but I mean small for depth, I mean constant, and small for circuits, I mean polynomial. Okay. And, but, and then when you say the class C star, you mean that the class C star should actually is a complexity class output the small Yeah, exactly. So so the yeah, the question here is if my polynomial has can be computed by a circuit in class C, I want its factors to be computed by circuits in the class C star. So maybe right, so, so, so yeah, exactly. The algorithm itself, the outputs the uh, output don't 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 Yeah, I don't care. So is it just an existence? Exactly. I don't yeah, yeah. don't care about the algorithm. And you're always going to assume that the degree is small. I just want to make yeah, so here for my talk, I'm always going to assume that degree is the polynomial. individual degree, not the total degree. Meaning? The degree of each variable in the polynomial is going to be bounded by a constant. So think of multilinear multi polynomial. Individual degree is going to be constant. Yeah. Constant, yes. Individual degree. So, okay, let me give you an example. Right, so. I. Oh, oops. <laughs> two, two things at the same time. So, yeah, so get that. if you assume that the degree is n, for example, you could have something like this x to the n, or black, okay. So, if, if, you're, if you're, let's say that if you bound the degree 
some odd things can happen because you can have x to the n plus let's say p of in some other variables y x n minus one p one plus p n of uh, y. Right. What I'm assuming here is that so this and and here say when you just bound the total degree you can have variables that are that are power to really high degree. I'm not assuming this. My my restriction here will be that all my polynomials, the individual degree will be bounded by a constant. This d will be constant for every variable. So I think you, if you want to think of bounded individual degree, think of multilinear. But then you can just allow quadratic or cubic. So for multilinear, you will show that if it would be computed by small depth circuit, the output would also be computed by a constant depth circuit? Yeah, yeah. so for multilinear, it's known by the works of Spilka and Volkovich that actually the C star is actually the same as C, provided that restrictions are, I mean, provided that the circuit class is nice, I mean, you, you can do restriction in it. Then for multilinear, this is true, yeah. and it's an observation of Spielke and Volkovich, but even for multi-quadratic, if you only allow polynomials of the form x squared plus p1 of x plus p2, then this is not known if the classes are the same. Yeah, this is the first frontier that we we don't, yeah. We're, there's the final frontier that Star Trek will explore, but this is the first frontier that we don't know anything about. Yeah, this, so uh, Arpita asked, it's a good question. Why, why are we studying bounded uh, individual degree? And there, there are some technical reasons why bounded individual degree should work. Uh, they should be good classes, because when you bound the individual degree, like there are wild objects like resultants, that they become simple objects when, the, when you bound the individual degree. So it's a good head start. We eliminate one of the problems that really hurt us. And then we're trying to say, let's try to understand the other problems first, and then we add the resultant on it, for example. That's my main motivation for studying these things. And the problem here already becomes widely non-trivial. Yeah? So, okay. So let me show the gap of understanding that we have now. Okay? So suppose that P is a polynomial with S monomials and degree D. Oh, sorry. Is it clear the scenario that we're dealing with now? Okay, so suppose that P is a polynomial with S monomials, so it's a sparse polynomial computed by that Q circuit, and the degree is D. Okay? So now if I apply Kalkoffen and depth reduction results, what I get is that the factors of P they can be computed by formulas of depth three or four, but the size is exponential in square root d, right? So the general depth reductions by Agarbal, Binay, Koiran, Pavenas, and Gupta, Kamat, Kayal, and Saptarishi, right? They all give us a sub-exponential gap, right? And moreover, they don't give us anything if the degree is quadratic. Right? So we're left with, uh, yeah, we're left in a kind of in the dark here, right? The situation looks pretty bad. And the question is, can this be improved just for factors? I mean, the, the depth reduction results, they're amazing, right? Yeah? Uh, if you don't do depth reduction, is anything better known just from Kaltofen about uh, last depth? other than what is known for general? Sorry? So if sparsity is not bound, uh, so for general uh, circuits where sparsity is not bounded, there is a result of Kaltofen you mentioned. And now if you run that on sparsity bounded circuits, does it give you anything special? You lose all the structures. You lose, you lose, yeah, you lose all the structures. So Kaltofen, so Kaltofen, so I think uh, Newton's question is, does Kaltofen give you anything special? And the answer is no. Yeah, the answer is Kaltofen did something very remarkable, and he had to assume the most powerful model that he can like. He had to assume circuits. His computation, actually, in the factory is a circuit, and is a circuit of depth linear, because you do hence the lifting, you use But for, <coughs> I just want to mention, for multilinear, it is true that if it is computed by depth 3, the factors would also be computed by small depth 3, that is true? Yeah, and I'll show it to you. It's not hard. So the, thing, the observation that you must have is, Suppose that my polynomial P, let's say, has variables x and y, 
okay, multilinear in x and y, it factors. So it must be the case that the factors must be, for some choice of x and y, f of x times g of y. Because if one of these polynomials had a, a, quadratic, a quadratic term, then this quadratic term will not cancel. Right? The same way that if, let's say, you multiply two univariate polynomials. One polynomial is xn plus, plus 1, and the other polynomial is x to the m plus something else, with all the coefficients. Once you multiply the higher, well, you can even put a1 and b1 here. Right? When you multiply these two polynomials, you know that the degree in x is n plus m. Correct? But for multilinear, if you look here at x, let's say a variable x1, variable x1 cannot appear in both polynomials. Because if it appeared, it appeared x1 here and x1, this product will have an x1 squared. And it's not the case. So in the multilinear setting, if you talk about factors, you're actually talking about variable disjoint factorization. Right? And so if you can restrict, then it's in your class. Is that clear to, to everyone? Why? Okay, so good. Yeah, so that's why in multilinear the problem becomes becomes easy. Then it's equivalent to PIT for So if I want to put f of x I just do a restriction on y and then I get a multiple of f. Yeah. This is a But this? No, the Kaltofen can be done black box as well. So, but the only thing that Kaltofen is going to promise you is that, so it, it asks the question that is Kaltofen, can, also, can it also be done black box? And yes, the answer is yes. And what Kaltofen will promise you is that if you give me a black box for the polynomial, I will give you what black boxes that compute the factors. Yeah, so he doesn't really exploit the internal structure of the surface. But in that Kavanaugh's impaglia result, don't, don't they only need multilinear factorization or what do they need? No, they need they need the general factorization because once you apply Nissan Wigderson yeah. in the Kavanaugh's impagliazzo, yeah. what you get is that, uh, that you each variable is a is a multilinear polynomial, but there's variables multiplying each other. Oh, yeah. So so you require factorization, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. So, so this, yeah. So this Filip and Volkovich showed that if you have PIT for the class for a slightly bigger class, then you can um, de-randomize this. Yeah. So on get test. So what are the requirements of PIT that you need to do factorization in this case to find actually the partition? But you actually need hitting sets, right? Not yeah. You need hitting sets. Black yeah. box PIT. Yeah. You need black box PIT, and Filip and Volkovich showed that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's important, yeah. So what Ram Prasad is saying is that this talk is not about complexity, it's about existence. Yeah, we, we care about we care about just of the statement. Does there exist a, a small circuit? I'm not even I'm, I'm not even concerned with the question of trying to compute it. I'm just first trying to say does there exist? Yeah, that's that's where we are. Yeah. So it's a non constructive talk. It's a non constructive <laughs> talk, but but I will construct it for you. So in this case I can construct. So yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, so that's a great conjecture and was made 30 years ago by Karl Toffen itself, himself and von Zergatten. Uh, yeah, so I'm no, 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 I'm talking about bounded individual degree. Yeah, they ask it, bounded individual degree, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah, they do, they do. <laughs> I, I was, okay, so let me say it, Ankit. <laughs> so An Ankit is unknowingly quoting Karl Toffen 30 years ago. So the, the question is, so Ankit is saying, well, what if I have a sparse polynomial with bounded individual degrees d, 
right? Can I bound the sparsity of the factors of this polynomial? And the answer is not no. No, no, my question. I just say if you have sparse polynomial undistributed in the system, only if you have the degree bound there. Oh, the whole degree bound is polynomial. There's no restriction. Just you have a normal sparse polynomial. Right. And if you are talking about only multilinear factors, then these factors must have bounded sparse. Oh, I see. That that's I think that's uh, Volkovich. He does something like. Uh, I also did, but, but oh, you also did. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, 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 so then you you tell me. I, my question was that if you start with a sparse polynomial and you only talk about factors where individual degrees are bounded. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, then I can can I prove those bounds? Yes. No. Yeah, yeah. So so a kid's question is like, well, you're here assuming that the polynomial, the input polynomial has bounded individual degree. But then suppose that I actually have a polynomial with just bounded degree, and now I just want to find the bounded individual degree factors of this polynomial. And I have bounded part. Yeah, that we don't know anything about. The only thing that we know is to, with Michael and I, we have something unpublished that you can find the constant degree, the whole degree. If you bound the whole degree, we can find it deterministically. And it's not quite simple. Um, okay, so now answering our, our Peter's question with a bit more detail, why bound the individual degrees of the polynomial? Well, polynomials with bound the individual degree, they form a very rich class, which generalizes multilinear polynomials, and is the first class for which the problem is non-trivial already. And they are well studied. And I mean, I should have added the works of Karl Popen and von Zergatten here, uh, but I was updating this yesterday because I found out many works have been done <laughs> lately. And uh, so this is well studied. It started with the works of Karl Popen and von Zergatten in 85, where they asked this question of the sparsity when the individual degree is bounded. And multilinear polynomials and, and Polynomials of bounded degree, degree have been worked, have been studied by Ras, Ras, Spilka, and Dayov, Ras, Spilka, Volkovich, Spilka, no, Saraf, Volkovich. Oh, and this KS squared is because it's uh, Kumar and Saraf, it's Marina, and the other one is Chandan and uh, Nilic. They have the same initials in the same paper in the same year. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and more recently, we also have uh, Nilic, Chandan, and, and Sebastian that published two other papers in giving lower bounds. For, for circuit classes that compute polynomial with bounded individual degree. K S T. Oh, Tavena. Oh, <laughs> yes. I, <laughs> last night. We will tell it. We will tell it. Yeah. Oh, it's, let's edit this. <laughs> okay. So. For multilinear polynomials, we already discussed the problem is trivial, and here very little is known, and so. We want to do a step towards understanding the general cases. And why this is nice, well, this is nice not just because many people asked about this, but it's also because the resultant is, is well behaved. So you have one thing that's well behaved, and we want to try to understand the rest, the behavior of the rest. So in this work, what, what did I do? Well, th this is the following theorem. The following theorem is that if P is a polynomial which has all the individual degrees bounded by R, and it's computed by a circuit or a formula of size s and f d, then any factor of p is computed by a circuit or a formula of size polynomial in entity r and s and f d plus 5. The depth can be actually made d plus 4, but for safety reasons, let's keep d plus 5. So furthermore, OK, this is not, to say that this talk is constructive, the result also provides a randomized algorithm for computing the factors in this representation. Okay? So we, are, we actually can find the, the factors in a randomized fashion. Okay, well, is that, so far, I mean, it's a lot of text. But anyways, it's just a... This is for any field? This is, so no, this is not for any field. This is, again, the same setting. If the characteristic, the characteristic needs to be larger than R, and if it's smaller, then I can probably promise everything that help out and can promise. Yeah, so okay, so Ben Lee asked a very good question. So to de-randomize this construction, do I only need PIT? Yes, but I need PIT for things of the, for things of that D plus 5. So it would be 
that six or seven, if you want to. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. So your randomized algorithm is also? All, all of them, yeah. So your randomized algorithm is also? My randomized algorithm? So it, uh, it is circuits of uh, poly size and depth D plus five, is that? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the, the so the PIT is so okay. So let me ask. So KV also has to know, what is the PIT that I need? Is is for circuits of that D plus five and poly and the R size? But I mean it's restricted, right? Whatever. Yeah, I mean the circuit is pretty simple. So whatever PIT you can get for this circuit, then then you can get the PIT for for the whole thing. And why? I mean, let me just say one word about why you need this PIT. In the end, is because when you want to do things deterministically, at the end. You, you seem to need to check whether the, the thing that you found actually divides the original polynomial. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need an extra PIT. Mm -hmm. it, so if it, let's say, let me just give you an overview of this theorem for sparse polynomials. Suppose that P is a polynomial that has individual degrees bounded by R, all of the individual degrees. As Amir is pointing out, it, I need all the individual degrees. And it's also computed by a circuit <coughs> with sparsity S. So it's size S and that's 2. Right? Then, I mean, I don't need strong PIT for resultants because the resultants themselves are going to be sparse polynomials. So then I can get away with a lot of things that Kalkoffen does, but then in the end, my guess for the circuit of the factor, I need to check if that actually divides my origin. And for that, I need uh, a stronger PIT. So the bundle of degree requires for the resultants to be small. Exactly. Yeah, don't too many holes in Yes, exactly. So the, the bound, yeah, really, the bound on all the degrees is really to control the resultant, and then we want to see what happens. Right? And even then, the, the best bound that we have so far is, is D plus 5. It'd be nice to get something a little bit better. Is that, is that scenario so clear so far? Yeah? This one good. In the settings, uh, do you have, what do you have as bounds on the degree of your factors? Are so there some clear bounds on the degree of your factors? No, so the, the factors can be any anything. So my only thing is that, so if I bound all the degrees of my of the individual degrees by R, yeah. my polynomial has degree bounded by Rn. Yeah. Sure. Right, but my factors can also have degree bounded by, let's say, R over two times N or something. Yeah. I, I don't so care about the bound. Okay. You don't have a yeah, they, they can be general, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the only, yeah, that's, and the only thing that actually, where I don't assume, well, yeah, with Michael, we, re we remove the, the, the promise here, but we need to promise that we only find a constant factor, so it's another trade-off. So it's a different work that has, yeah. 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 Constant degree factors that we can find for certain classes, but it's not published, so I don't want to talk about it here. No, but the individual degrees cannot increase in the factors, yeah? Yeah, so the individual degree, but the total degree, I think the question that he asked is that the total degree of the polynomial could be this much. So I find fa factors that have non-constant total degree, but the, obviously the, the bound of the individual degrees are, are yeah, it's R minus one. Yeah, so in a sense they are simple in that way, right? If you look at each variable, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay, so prior to this work, which is a huge inspiration for this work, is the following works. The work by Gears Pyukai Hodayov that says that if P in many variables, x1 up to x and y, is computed by a circuit of size s and f d, and the degree in y of p is bounded by r, then its factors of the form y minus gx, which from now on I will call the roots, okay, the roots of the polynomial p, they have that d plus 3 circuit and size poly n to the r and s. Okay, so that's the result. If you have a circuit in one variable, the degree is bounded by a constant r, then all of its roots, also they are simple. Okay, and they seem to be very important. Now, why did they care about it? Well, I never asked them, but I read the paper, and in the paper they asked because they wanted to extend the hardness versus randomness approach of Cabanets and Pagliazzo to bound to that circuits. Are there any other? Because <laughs> I'll, I'll add it here. I, I left some blank space for it. <laughs> so, and, and why were they interested only in the roots? Is that, well, as Kip Dunn was asking, well, the roots, they noticed that the roots are the only factors that you really need to extend Cabanets in Pagliazzo to bounded depth. 
Because really, Cabanitz and Pagliazzo, the factors they are looking for is the factors of the formula Y minus GX. I'm a bit confused. So now, if I yeah. say that they are individually bounded also in the X variables. In the X variables. They will also put factors which will necessarily have. Yeah. So, so, so these are very special forms. These are linearly Y. These are. Oh, these are. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I think for this result, you don't. You just need the Y degree to be bounded. Yeah, yeah. For for yeah, yeah. This this is the thing. For Virchow and Hadayoff, they only need the degree of Y <coughs> to be bounded by R. I mean, in a sense. Yeah. If you want to find the roots in Y, then you need the degree of of Y to be bounded. But if you pick any other variable and you want to find the roots in that variable, they also need the, the individual degree of that variable to be bounded. And that's why I'm, I'm going to assume that all of the variables are bounded because I need, I need that to use the result. The factors need not be of this form. If they are of this form, then they have this form. Exactly, yeah. So what Vier's paper and I have proved is only factors of this form. Only the roots, they have uh, bounded circuits, yeah. OK, so now. Let's talk about the main ideas of this work. There's three main ideas that go into factoring results. Mm -hmm. So how does it trans translate for this individual boundary thing? Yeah, so so the thing is for uh Kopartis, uh Saraf and Spilka, what they do is that they show that general white box PIT will give you white box factorization. So uh, it, it, because what they yeah what, what happens there is that they, they are showing that the Kaltofen can be done in a in a white box manner. But it's still but the underlying work there is still Kaltofen. So you still in a sense get some you're still gonna mess up the structure of the circuit. That's the problem. Yeah. It doesn't say anything if you restrict the classes. Yeah it'd be very nice if if you could. So, so to prove the, the, the main theorem, what are the main ideas that go into it? Well, there has to be lifting, because so far most of the techniques in factory have lifting. We have root approximation, which we just need to transfer the works of Vir, Spirk, and Hodayov, not to work with the exactly exact roots, but with approximations to these roots. And then an operation called reversal that we already saw one time here, and I'll show it again. And then I'll give an outline on how everything fits together. Okay, so let's talk about lifting first. Now, suppose that our input is very nice. I'm, I'm just going to give you the nicest polynomial that I can find. Okay, my p of x y is a monic polynomial in y. Just notice I want to point out two things that are nice, right? P of x y now is going to be monic in y, and all of its factors are roots. So all of its factors are linear factors in y. Right? So then, in this case, we're in safe territory, right? My academic grandfather here already did this for me, so I can, you know, I can say I'm safe here. Then, huh? <laughs> uh, right, so then, what do we do in this case? How do we find the factors G1 and G2? Okay? So, now, let's also assume, which we can, I'm going to make a lot of nice assumptions, but with technical, it's just technicalities, okay? So you can deal away with that. So now let's assume that mu1, when I say, when I restrict g1 to 0 and g2 to 0, they, their values are different, okay? So I'll call mu1 g1 of 0 and mu2 g2 of 0, and they're different. We can assume that by some standard technique, so I'll assume that. Now, how do we, fact that, how do we find the factors in this case? Well, we can try to build the homogeneous parts of each of the factors one at a time. Right, and that's the idea in the Beer of Lyoff, is that they say, well, let's build the homogeneous parts of GI one at a time. Okay, so how do we do this? Note that P of zero Y, comma Y, is equal to Y minus mu one and Y minus mu two. So this we all know Baskara, we know how to solve you know quadratic equations, so we know how to factor this. So we found mu one and mu two. Now we found the constant terms. How do we find the linear terms? I just want to find the linear parts of G1 and G2. So here's how we do it. So if I set y equals to mu1 in the input polynomial, what do I get? I get p of x mu1 is equal to mu1 minus g1 of x 
times mu1 mu1 minus g2 of x. But now notice, since mu1 is different from mu2, the constant term of mu1 minus mu g2 is different from 0. Whereas the constant term of the first term of mu1 minus g1 is actually equal to 0. That's why I made that substitution. So the linear term of my input polynomial, which I have a circuit for, that's a very important thing. The linear term of the polynomial that I have a circuit for is equal to the linear term of g1 of x, of the first root, up to some constant. Right? So then by interpolation, which, as Michael said, our eyes already bled from looking at all the interpolation, we know how to factor, right? So we know how to find the linear part. Good. So we're happy, right? And then, if we continue this way, by instead of now applying the substitution of mu1 here, I apply mu1 plus the linear part of g1, then again, I'm going to make this a degree 2 polynomial, and this, because I still have mu1, is going to still be non-zero, right? So the quadratic term of that substitution is going to be the quadratic term that I want. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So, okay, so if I continue this way, I can recover the homogeneous parts one at a time, and in the end, I'll factor my input polynomial. Okay? And this idea is nice, has two names. That's how nice it is. It's called Hansel lifting or Newton iteration, and it's pervasive in factoring algorithms such as as early as Zazenhaus and Kaltofen and Birchberg and and many other algorithms that you can find. Okay, even Nestor and Shalovas, they use hence the lifting. So it's pervasive in all the factoring algorithms that we know. So now, again, I just want to show this lemma again so we can stare it, so we can remember, right? So, because it's got, I'm going to use this in the next part. Again, what they say is that the Virchberger Hadayov used this hence the lifting, they do hence the lifting in exactly this way, to show that you can obtain this depth to the d plus 3 circuit. Okay? So, okay. So now, there are two main <coughs> issues here that we have to overcome if we, if we want to generalize this result, right? What's the first main issue? Well, first main issue is that p of x, y may not factor into linear factors in y. Right? That was one nice thing about the polynomial, but we need to resolve that. And how we're going to deal with it? Well, we're going to approximate the roots in the the roots of y in the algebraic closure by low degree polynomials. Okay, that's how we can overcome the first question. Now the second problem is a more subtle one. What if p of x y is not monic in y? Because remember we assumed that the polynomial was monic, right? So we somehow need to retrieve that leading coefficient, and then we need to use reversal to reduce the number of variables as well. Okay. So, okay, so what is the first issue? The first nice thing about the polynomial that I gave to you in the first example was that the polynomial was P of x, y. It was equal to y minus some polynomial g1, y minus some polynomial g2. But now, it may not be the case that this happens. It may be the case that my first polynomial now is y squared minus g1, y, minus g1 prime, and this. and this does not factor into linear factors. So somehow I have to recover the roots of this guy. Yeah? And then, so the, the idea is just to adapt Virchberg-Gerdayov to work with uh, also approximations, which generalize nicely. But the second problem is that this polynomial p may not be monic in y. And by that, I mean that this polynomial may have let me just do the full thing. So the polynomial P of x, y may factor like this. Q of x times Q1 of x, y to some power, plus a bunch of other things, right? Some polynomial of degree k, let's say. And then here, I have Q2 of x, and the degree here, let's say, r minus k, plus some other constant. Right? So that's the second problem. My polynomial may not be monic, and it may factor like this. Factors times q, the leading term factor like q, and then I have a q1 in one of the factors, q2 
and I have a Q2 as the leading coefficient of the second factor. Is that clear what the second difficulty is now? Yeah? So in a sense, I need to recover from P of x, y, I need to recover what Q is, I need to recover what Q1 is, and I need to recover what Q2 is. Right? So they may not be one. Right? In the first case, it was easy. So for that, we need to use reversal, and we'll see what the subtlety of this problem is. Okay? So, okay. So now, let's talk about the second part of this work, which is root approximation. Okay? So, suppose now our input is still monic, but does not factor into linear factors. Okay? So now, let's decompose P into a product F of x, y times Q. Both of them are monic in Y, because P is monic, where then F is equal to Y to the K plus a bunch of other things with coefficients that are different from 1. Right? So now what I'm saying, well, because P is monic, all of its factors must be monic in Y. So then, if I have this decomposition, I'm going to just write F of X, Y as a monic polynomial. Right? Just one here, and the other coefficients are arbitrary polynomials in F, in X. But now, I can also assume, and again, this is a technical assumption, but, but I can assume that F is irreducible and does not divide the other factor. Okay? So my polynomial P does not have F squared as a factor. Okay? It's only F. Okay? So, and, and it, will be, it will be clear soon why I need this assumption. Okay? So, now, the question is, well, we don't have the factorization into linear factors, but any polynomial factors completely in the algebraic closure of any field. Right? Factors completely into linear factors. So what are we going to do? Let's go to the algebraic closure of fx. And for now, just think of f here as the complex numbers. You know, everything is nice. So then p is going to be equal. We can write p of x, y as the product of y minus some phi i of x. Now this phi i is some element in the algebraic closure which is a very complex object, and I don't want you to think about it. I just want you to think of that phi i as some function in x, okay? Some arbitrary function in x. Now, if p factors in this way, it must be the, and f divides p, it must be the case that f must borrow some of the roots of p. Some of the roots of p must be roots of f as well, because f divides p. Right? You can just think of it as univariate polynomials. Right? If to divide, they have to, this set of roots has to be a subset of this. Okay, so now just think of this phi i as a function on the variables x. Now, okay, so now the idea is the following. Since p and f, they share these roots phi i, what we want to do is we want to try to approximate these roots phi by some polynomials g i t x such that f of x g i t x has only terms of degree higher than t. Now, if you're not from, if you don't like algebra, which is, which probably you like, but you like calculus, what you can think about is when you look at these roots phi i of x, you can just take its Taylor expansion, right? That's the way you approximate it, and in calculus and even in algebra. So what we want to do is, well, to find the Taylor expansion of phi i by this polynomial g i of t. That's going to be exactly the, it's going to correspond exactly to the Taylor expansion if I'm in, let's say, Cx, right? If the field is C. Right, right. Yeah, no, this is, this is still in the lifting part, exactly. Yeah, this is still the lifting idea, yeah. You just need to extend them to, to, to work for, for this way, yeah. So, so then, now, let's define a topology for this, right? Because we're in the algebraic world, so we need to just define a topology. And what is a topology? It's not an algebra word, so it's just a measure of distance, right? So we say that f of x is equal up to t to g, if the polynomial f of x minus g of x only has terms of degree higher than t. Right? So this defines a topology on how close two polynomials are. Two polynomials are close if they're equal up to a really large t. Right? 
So we can just define this topology. And now that we have the sense of distance, we say, again, the definition gives the topology. So they are close if they agree on many low degree parts. And we can use this topology now to derive analogs of Taylor series for elements of F bar. Okay, so you, you really don't need to know the structure of F bar. You just need to borrow the intuition from there that you can factor in the closure. And then now we can use this to derive. Okay, and this is some calculations, some pages. And so I won't talk about it here. And therefore, we can approximate the elements of F by polynomials. Okay, so either you cite a bunch of theories or you do it in an elementary way. And in the paper, it's done in elementary ways. That's why it takes a couple of pages and doesn't have the space in the slides. So now, if we can find these approximations of the roots such that f, so, so such that these are actually approximation of roots, then we can prove the following theorem, right? It's the following <coughs> The polynomials GIT are such that f approximates up to degree t the product of y minus the roots, right? And this is exactly like the intuition that we have from Taylor, which is, well, if I approximate the roots, the analytic functions by polynomials, then this polynomial must approximate this other polynomial. Right? So it just works exactly the way it works in the analytical sense. Okay? So then we can convert. So what's the punchline of this thing? Is that we can convert approximations to the roots into approximations of the polynomials themselves. And this is what's going to allow us to extend the virch dirichlet dial. It's exactly the fact that we can convert the approximation of the roots into approximations of the actual factors. Right? Which is what you're saying. is in the same sense of Kalkoffen. Right, it's the same spirit as all of the algorithms. Even even Lester Lange does it. So um, now, how do we obtain these polynomials GIT of x? Because they are roots of the factor, right? But remember, since each phi is also root of p of x y, which we had circuits for, they are also we can obtain these GIT x from p x y by lifting, right? So I have access to the roots phi i. Even though they're roots of our factor, I have access to these roots because I have access to the circuit P. So again, I can use the lifting that I, def that I described to you in the first slide to lift the roots of, uh, of F, right? And how does it work? Well, I know that I have the constant part of the root. I know that I have phi i of zero because I can just factor univariate polynomials. And then I, since those, and now, uh, for the people who, really want to see the details, right? So here's where the assumption, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah. So I'm going to address, yeah, to, to you then, Ankit. I was going to say to people in general who are concerned about this, and Ankit raised the concern, is the following. So Ankit is saying, well, for, for me to lift a root uniquely, I need roots to not collapse when I substitute, right? And that's why I assume that P of x, y, I have to assume that P factors into F of x, y times Q of x, y, where F does not divide Q. If I have this assumption, which I can make by taking enough partial derivatives, right? Then I can find a substitution x such that when I substitute x here by some vector alpha, y, then the roots that are f roots, they're not going to uh, overlap with the roots of q. And if they don't overlap, I don't have any singularities, right? So I can actually, the lifting that I'm doing, I'm lifting a non-singular point. Yeah? That's why I needed to assume that f does not divide q. If f divided q, then you're right. I have, I have a singularity, and then I cannot resolve it. <coughs> Yeah, but here we can actually find a non-singular point. Okay. Yeah, is that clear? The assumption. Okay, good. So now, if you look at our parameters, so we found these approximations of the roots, and the way we find the approximations of the roots is exactly by extending the Virchow and Lyell. Okay, the exact same procedure. They just carries out nicely. And how is our parameter so far? So I know that f my 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 factor can be approximated by this polynomial. But Virchow-Kohodayov gives us that this root is a depth d plus 3, and the size is poly n to the r and s. 
Therefore, I'm adding one more product gate here. Okay, so my depth went from d plus 3 from the roots to at most d plus 4. And my size is still poly into the RNS. Right? And now, well, I said standard techniques because for general audience, but for you guys, with interpolation, right, I give you this, and then you can recover actually f of x, y. Okay, yeah? So again, how, how do you do the lifting in uh, three extra depth? Yeah, so lifting, lifting has these logarithmically many steps, right? Correct. So, so Nitin asked the following question: How how do I get d plus three? So how did DSY manage to get d, d plus three? And the way that they managed to do it is by exploiting the idea of the bounded individual degree. So what they say is that suppose I have my circuit that computes p of x y. Okay, is it big enough, or should I write bigger? Can everyone see? Okay, so suppose that I have the circuit that computes p of x, y. Now, what you notice that if you look at Karl Toffen, what he's really doing is, from this circuit, pick other circuits now, which may be a little bigger, for the coefficients. So here I have pr. So let's say that p of x, y is equal to sum of y to the k, p of k of x. Okay? So what they notice is that what count often does, what these lifting procedures do, is they only work with the coefficients of the polynomial, which is very intuitive if you think about, a, let's think about univariate sense, right? Univariate, if I give you a polynomial and has these coefficients, the roots, they must depend only on the coefficients themselves. Is that true? That, that everyone agrees, right? Good. So now, what Wierspieker have noticed is that, okay, give me this polynomial, that has then big circuits for all of these pk, all of the coefficients, right? pk of x. And here, notice that I draw, I drew this small and this bigger, because this may be bigger than this. We don't know lower bounds, right? We don't know comparison. So this is bigger. Maybe I should put bigger here <laughs> to make it really not subtle, small. Okay. So you pick circuits computing the coefficients, and now. What they show is that the roots are act is actually a polynomial in these polynomials. So what I mean by this is that any root, uh, what is the any root phi i of x? What Virchow and above shows is that they are equal to some polynomial g i of p zero of r of x up to p r of x. Okay, but now notice that if this g, and, and they, what they show is that this polynomial is of degree at most. I want to say just let's say n squared. Okay, now you have a polynomial of n squared degree, which might be really large, but the point is that if r is constant, this is an r by the way. If r is constant, then how many monomials can this gi have? can have at most n to the r. N, n to the r, yeah. n to the o of r. Right? So then what do they do? The clever idea is, well, g is a sparse polynomial. So what so happens is that... So this gi you find by some preprocessing? Yeah, exactly. You find by the lifting. The lifting will give you the, the gi. <laughs> yeah. So what they do is pick my polynomial p0 up to pr, then pick the sparse polynomial that gi computes, and gi is a sparse polynomial in all of these prs. So then, really, you're only adding that 2. And now you may ask me, but why does Beer, Stricker, and Dioff need that d plus 3? Well, they need that d plus 3 because of that shift that Ankit asked about, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to somehow do a shift of the variables and sometimes you have to add an extra depth on the bottom. To make them monic, for example. Yeah, exactly. To make it monic. Yeah, and also to make the var them variable splitting, right? Like the roots cannot so be singular. The and uh, yeah, and then they inter yeah, but I don't want to say that because I, I I need that product gate. So yeah. So does that make sense? Yes, you completely unfold the lifting basically. Exactly. They completely yeah, they just yeah, they do the lifting and they just do brute force now because it has low number of variables. Yeah. 
So, okay, so is that answer questions? Uh, uh -huh. the is why you don't care about what G is. No, because G is a sparse polynomial. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm opening GI here, sparse. Yeah. So the, the whole point, the, the key idea of, of DSY is that you really don't care what GIs are when you have bounded individual degrees, right? You can just brute force open everything. Yeah. Now, so with standard techniques, we can actually go from the approximation here to actually F. But to do that, as you've seen for many days now in the bootcamp, right? Um, to do that, I need to put that extra sum gate here, right? So that's really dangerous. We, we don't want to do that now. So now what I want to do is I want to hold on to that interpolation that we really are itching ourselves to do and just leave this product gate here. So right now I know that F can be approximated by a depth of D plus 4 and size poly N. Okay? So that's the observation. For the general case, let's hold our horses and keep that product pending on the top. Okay? So now we cover the root approximation, right? That's how we approximate the roots. We just kind of try to emulate the Taylor series by and, and approximate the roots, and then we construct the factor of f, right? And now we need to talk about reversal, which comes to the point why I drew this circuit smaller than this one. Yeah. Now we're going to address this question. So the setup is the following now. Suppose our input is the whole thing now. We're attacking the general case, right? You don't care about this ugly expression. The only thing you need to care is that P now has a leading coefficient PR and a constant coefficient. And I just want to assume that both of them are non-zero. Okay? So assume that, that's, that I have that. And that's possible just by shifting Y again. Right? So now, again, let's assume that P factors just like F and Q, and F does not divide Q again because I don't want the singularities. Right? I want to stay, remain on singular. But now, notice that f will be also a general factor, right? We'll have a leading term fk and a constant term f0. Okay? So now, again, let's assume that f again is irreducible and does not divide the other factor to keep addressing at its point that we need the roots to be done singular. So now, what's the game plan? Well, the game plan is I divided the talking four, four parts, right? The first part was lifting, the second part was root approximation, so, and somehow I need to use that. So the game plan is the following. We are going to reduce the monic case, right? How do we reduce it? The usual way, right? We just factor out the leading terms, and the game plan is the following. First, I want to recover the leading term fk from the leading term pr, because I know that fk divides pr. I want to recover it by some kind of induction, and then I want to use the monic case to recover this factor now to this factor. Yeah? But you might ask, well, Rafael, you're working now with rational functions. And yes, we will work with rational functions. And how will we do it? We're going to bypass rational functions by using some other polynomials. Okay? But still, we want to recover this. So what is the naive recursion here? Um, okay, so okay, so I want you to just trust me that I can do the I can work with rational functions because the real problem is not really rational functions. The real problem is what's going to happen now at the recurrence. So suppose that we can do both of these steps. So what would happen to our final circuit? Okay, so let's say P has individual degrees bounded by R has n variables, and is computed by a circuit of size s and f d. Now, let's define t of s n to be an upper bound, well, here are the conditions, to be an upper bound on the size of any circuit computing the factor f. Okay? So t of s n, in informal terms, will be an upper bound on any circuit computing f of x y. Okay? But is it any circuit? No. It's not any circuit. Here are the conditions, okay? Such that there exists, is a, T is an upper bound on this phi, such that phi actually approximates F up to degree T, and has depth D plus 4. The size is the bound that I told you, and the top fitting is a product gate. So what I, what I give is that T S N is an upper bound 
on that kind of factor is on that kind of approximation that we found in the previous section. Okay, suppose they have this upper bound. Now, how is the recurrence going to look like? So the recurrence is going to look like this. T of S n, when I have n variables and the size s, is going to be less than or equal than this right side. Now what does this mean? Well, T of 3 R s comma n minus 1 is what I pay to recover f, f, f k of x from P of to recover the leading coefficients. Why? Let me stop here for, for minutes because I know this slide is a bit confusing. So I'm going to redraw the picture. Oh, how much time do I have? Minus 10. Minus 10? Oh, OK. <laughs> five, five, five is good. OK, I'll do five. OK, so here's the thing, right? <laughs> Sorry, guys. So here's the thing. I have my circuit that computes P of x, y. And now, if we do interpolation, what are we doing? Well, we're picking up many evaluations of y, right? And we're computing a circuit. And this circuit will output some coefficient, pk of x. Right? So that's why the circuit that computes the coefficient of p of y may be actually bigger. And that's the blow up that comes here. Because this is the size of the circuit computing pr. And I have n minus 1 variables. So I gain that I have less variables, but I have a blow up in size. And here is just the factors. Here is just what I pay for the factors that depend on y. Right? So this is my recurrence. But obviously, after t steps, I get this 3r to the t blow up. Right? Which in the end, all of the machinery doesn't work because this is still exponential when t goes roughly to n. Right? So what, what do we need here? Well, how to avoid the exponential growth? It's hard to get the leading coefficient of p of x, y. As far as we know. We don't know any better bounds. But there's one coefficient there that's very easy. Which one it is? Is p0. p0 is very easy. Why? Because p0 is just a restriction of p. So we know that if p is like this, p0 is a bit smaller. Yeah? Is it small enough? <laughs> okay, so p0 is smaller. So now, what if we could make p0 actually to be the leading coefficient? Because then we can recurse on something smaller. Right? So then, this is actually called reversal. I didn't know, but it was actually used by von Zurgaten, as I should have guessed at some point. So this is a definition of reversal, by example. Okay? So if p of x, y is equal to, let's say, a polynomial degree 5 in y, p5, y5, p4, y4, p0, its reversal is just what you get by inverting the coefficients. Right? So, I mean, we have already seen this, right? And we know that the reversal can be efficiently computed, right, from the circuit, by interpolation. So we're good. Now with the reversal, how does our recursion look like? So now our recursion becomes t of s n becomes less than or equal than t of s n minus 1 because now I need to recover f0 from p0. So my circuit size did not increase, but my number of variables decreased. And then as we all know from... What is the reversal? It's the completely change to the... I just reversed the order of... Yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. So Ido is asking, well, if you do a reversal, what happens to the factors? I mean, you're not finding the same facts. But it turns out that if you factor the reversal polynomial, the factors also get reversed. So it's the same thing. That's the nice thing about reversals that the factors are nice. You're just y by one over y. Yeah, I'm just reversing y and multiplying by y to the k. Yes, exactly. So nothing changes in terms of factoring. Okay, so I avoid... Okay, now the outline, which I have... Well, I already told you all of that. So, okay, we have the roots, this has d plus 4. Okay, so now everything has d plus 4 and product gate because, again, I computed this h, the leading term with product gate and with product gate, so I don't add a depth. And that's why I needed to maintain the approximation. Right? And then from now, here I add one more depth by doing interpolation to actually find my reversed factor. And once I find it, I can reverse it again. And so now I'll conclude because I have minus 10 minutes. So I'm not going to recap this work. I guess we talked about it too long. Open questions. I, oh, I think I want to talk about open questions. One minute? Okay. So open questions, right? I mean, the big open question, big and blatant open question is, can we remove the exponential dependence on the degree for factors of the form y minus gx? That's, I think, the biggest open question. Because then we get better complexity. And we can generalize for all circuits. Now. 
here, yeah, so another question is just for sparse polynomials. Can we show that sparse polynomials have small that four circuits as factors? E even for bounded individual degree. Even for that case is wide open, we don't know. Right? And the third the third question I guess would be to de randomize polynomial factorization, even for bounded individual degree polynomials. Even for sparse bounded individual degrees, we do not know uh, deterministic algorithm for factoring. Okay? For giving out the factors. You assume that the, you conjecture the two is possible? So, do I conjecture? Quasi poly true. Quasi poly true, yeah. <laughs> Quasi poly is true. Right? But if you want to restrict the depth, then, then I don't know. I, I won't venture into conjecturing yes or no. Yeah? So, yeah, I guess that's it. Thanks.